Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 21 of the course Applied Seismology for Engineers. Myself Dr. Abhishek Kumar. In the discussion so far, we have discussed about the process of earthquake occurrence starting from the source, how the waves which will be generated at the source will undergo attenuation, loss because of heat, particle oscillation, scattering. Finally, these waves after a lot of changes will reach to the bedrock at the site of interest and then subsequently modifying the characteristics of these vibrations which generated from the source subsequently modified by the propagation path and then subsequently it will be modified by different layers which are available above the bedrock level and up till the surface level. As a result, there will be significant change in the ground motion characteristics between the bedrock, between the surface. In addition, when we were discussing about different kinds of waves, we also discussed this as the wave propagate through a particular medium, primarily I am talking about seismic waves or specifically about P wave, S waves. So, when waves are propagating through a particular medium, this will cause either compression, rarefaction or shearing in the medium. So, to in today's class, we will be discussing about a critical phenomena which is called as liquefaction. As the name suggests, it is basically related to the transformation of the soil which during static condition in general is offering lot of resistance, lot of bearing capacity. As far as the same soil primarily witnessed in cohesionless soils subjected to high ground water table. So, when such a condition is exposed to earthquake loading primarily moderate to strong earthquake loadings, what will happen that because of the propagation of the waves there will be development of excess pore pressure. So, even though there was some pore pressure, but as the wave passed through a particular medium, which you can see uh, wave propagating from bedrock to the surface, when these waves are subjected to a particular medium, it will trigger additional loading on your soil medium. As a result of this additional loading, there will be development of excess pore pressure whatever pore pressure was there because of the presence of water in the soil medium, now that will start increasing because of additional loading. Primarily, it is happening because of earthquake. In addition, such loading can also happen due to lot of construction activities happening in and around of your site of interest. Same way, it can also happen during blastings, maybe because of some query or even at some construction site, some blasting is happening that at times can also trigger increase in pore water pressure. Now, consider a situation there were particles which were very close to each other in a soil medium and in those particles there was water also present in between the particles. Now, because of excess pore water pressure which will try to actually push the particles away from each other. As a result, what will happen? These particles which were actually in contact with each other as a result during static condition the ground was offering lot of resistance. So, here I am talking about the particular soil medium, particles were there very close to each other. So, you can say the medium was approximately very high relative density such that you can ensure before setting up a foundation that the material is significantly strong, so that it can sustain overcoming load from the superstructure. Now, during earthquake loading what will happen because of additional loading which is coming from the propagation of seismic waves, there will be development of excess pore pressure. Because of this excess pore pressure what it will try? It will try to push actually the particles away from each other. So, initially if this was the state of the soil. Now, during liquefaction or as a result of increase in pore water pressure, you will see the particles are pushed away from each other. So, the, the overcoming load remains the same, the foundation remains the same, but the bearing medium which was available beneath the foundation which was otherwise providing lot of resistance to overcoming load 
Now, in this particular case, which is defined as the state of liquefaction, all the particles, all the soil particles have been pushed away from each other and the gap which is there in between the particle, it is basically filled up by water which was earlier also it was there, but now there is additional pore water pressure or excess pore pressure. So, consider the state in which load is there, but the medium which otherwise was stable now has been replaced by another medium which is almost kind of slurry or liquid, particles are very far from each other and in between the particle there is water. So, it is in this particular state whatever load you are applying it will not be able to sustain that particular load. If you have a foundation, foundation will undergo either total settlement or differential settlement. If such thing is happening along the pavement you can see differential settlement, development of cracks even at the top surface also. Bridge abutments are there, if foundation of the bridge abutment undergoes liquefaction you can see failure of the bridge abutment which has also been seen lot of uh, uh, liquefaction related damages have been reported during 1964 Niigata earthquake as well as Alaska earthquake. And since then lot of studies related to liquefaction occurrence and uh, the, the phenomena of triggering of liquefaction at a particular site related to earthquake loading condition or even under static condition has been studied by different literatures. So, different researchers have proposed lot of understanding related to what is the triggering criteria which is helpful for initiation of liquefaction. So, in, in general this particular topic of liquefaction in this particular course has been divided into four lectures. Initial three lectures we will be discussing about the state criteria which defines what is actually the state with respect to the initial state, state when, when whenever we are saying it is like with respect to the loading condition what is the state of stress in which the soil was there initially and when the same soil is subjected to whether increase in confinement, decrease in confinement, change in diabetic stress, how the state of stress with respect to initial state will change and subsequently how this will lead to failure which in this particular case we are defining as a state of liquefaction or a state when the soil from a completely stable medium has been transformed to almost like a liquid form. So, how this transition between the initial state to final stage of liquefaction has been happening we will discuss in lecture uh, 21, 22 and 23. Subsequently in lecture 24 we will also discuss how one can quantify the factor of safety how one can quantify the potential of a particular site to undergo liquefaction. So, many a times when we are dealing with uh, microzonation studies or development of liquefaction hazard map of a particular site or a particular region, we will be doing uh, quantitative assessment of what is the strength soil is offering, how much is the loading condition and based on these two comparison we can come up with whether a particular site depending upon its in situ strength properties which can be measured from uh, a number of in situ field investigations. So, that will help us in uh, determining how much the liquefaction resistance of a particular site. At the same time we will also try to find out how much is the loading which is going to get generated during a particular earthquake. So, once the loading is there which is going to generate stresses and in situ st strength condition which is going to tell us how much resistance soil is going to offer. Comparing these two terms, keeping the loading criteria on same scale, we will be able to determine how much is the factor of safety a particular soil for a given earthquake loading is going to offer. So, that we will discuss in lecture 24. We will also talk about few of the numericals about how to quantify the liquefaction potential of a particular site taking various factors correlations into account. So, as far as state criteria is there. Now, in earlier uh, lecture also we had discussed about the, uh, the particle movements, change in ground uh, uh, change in uh, ground motion characteristics. In lecture 24 we will be also discussing about uh, depending upon the characteristics of the soil such as relative density, uh, liquid limit, initial moisture content, plastic limit all those things 
directly will give an indication about whether a site which is consisting of a particular soil, it is prone to undergo liquefaction or not. So, this is to identify what are the particular soils which are prone to undergo liquefactions. That means, if favorable conditions are given, these soils will undergo liquefaction. Now, how this will undergo liquefaction, how the initial state of the soil will change such that whatever was the uh, under static condition and then subject it to additional loading whether it is because of static loading or because of dynamic loading finally, reaching to its failure that we will discuss in state criteria which will give us a clear understanding about what are the soils based on the initial state which can be classified as liquefiable what are the soils based on initial state which can be classified again as non liquefiable. So, as I mentioned same thing is written over here even if a soil meets the criteria, criteria means you can go with Chinese criteria, you can go with modified Chinese criteria that will give you inherent characteristics of the soil based on which one can identify whether the soil particular soil is meeting the criteria of liquefaction or soil has the susceptible to undergo liquefaction or not. However, whenever we go with state criteria, we are interested that considering the initial state of the soil, considering the loading condition in a particular soil, whether the soil will be susceptible, whether the soil, what is the state in which the soil will move from the initial state in order to reach to its liquefaction. At the same time, we will also be able to differentiate between the soil which are liquefiable, which are not liquefiable or which are susceptible to liquefaction, which are not susceptible to liquefaction. So, that we will discuss in state criteria. Now, the primary uh, uh, works uh, uh, done by uh, Casa Grande in 1936 may become the base for uh, understanding the critical state criteria as far as uh, the initiation of liquefaction is concerned. So, in, uh, in 1936 Casa Grande basically Casa Grande in 1936 basically performed strain controlled strain controlled drain test drain test strain controlled drain test were performed by Casa Grande in 1936 so, this is the uh, research paper one can refer to, one is interested to uh, further go into the details. And this test was performed on loose soil as well as dense soil. So, based on see primarily we are talking about cohesionless soil over here, uh, which are also subjected to very high ground water table, high ground water table. Usually, we, we consider as a worst scenario that the ground water table is almost reaching to the ground surface. If it is deeper than that, then depending upon the depth of the ground water table and taking into account what is the susceptibility of that particular site, what, what is the historical uh, scenarios witnessed during different earthquakes, one can suitably take a decision like what should be the depth, otherwise maximum time. The, the depth of ground water table is considered up till the ground surface, so that it can represent the worst scenario as far as liquefaction occurrence is concerned. So, high ground water table, this is the uh, favorable conditions at as far as the soil is concerned as well as ground water table is concerned. Why? Primarily because the occurrence of liquefaction is more confined to excess pore per, uh, water pressure. So, Casa Grande 1936 performed strain control test and then based upon strain control test they identify it was observed that whenever you are doing strain control test. So, you are having diabetic stress based upon the observations which were experienced during a particular test it was observed that whenever you are doing a testing you will be having some value of diabetic stress and some value of confining pressure also. So, accordingly one can get an understanding about stress strain curve. So, this is corresponding to epsilon value. Now, here if you see 
So, this is derivative stress versus strain value. Now, when we uh, if, if we recall the behavior of cohesionless soil subjected to loading condition, primarily we will see two types of behavior. Whenever we are discussing about loose material subjected to loading, what is happening over the material will undergo strain hardening. So, you can see throughout the state of loading, the, this was the initial state of the soil and then from here we started loading the sample subjected to increase in debiotic stress, which is the representation of additional loading which is coming from superstructure, surcharge load or any other load which primarily going to trigger additional loading in the soil medium. So, whenever soil at a particular site is loose, it will be subjected to strain hardening. So, material will go to its denser state. This is about the loose material. The classification of loose and dense depending upon the relative density one can do. At the same time, if you take dense material So, loose material was subjected to strain hardening. You can see over here, primarily over here, that the material is undergoing strain softening. Initially, the, the material started taking a load. You can see over here from the initial part. Then, after reaching a peak value, you can see the material has shown a signature of strain softening. As a result, whatever loading it was taking, diabetic stress it was taking, suddenly you will see the, the load carrying capacity of the material has reduced because of strain softening and subsequently the material is also showing significant increase in the axial strain values. So, this is the, uh, uh, the basic nature whenever strain control tests are done under drain condition. Now, at the same time, if we are interested to find out what is happening at void ratio level because primarily we are looking from void ratio point of view. So, this is again diabetic stress and then this is again about void ratio. So, I am interested to find out what is happening at void ratio condition. Now, here we see that whenever there is consider this is the state of stress of initial soil sample. Now, here we can see that the void ratio is increasing in this particular direction V increasing. So, we are saying like as we are moving towards your uh, left hand side void ratio is increasing. So, this you can say void ratio corresponding to dense medium and this is void ratio corresponding to loose medium. Now, here what we saw actually whether you are subjected uh, dense specimen subjected to loading condition initially it will take the load reach to the peak value and followed by strain hardening and it will continue and certainly there will be a stage come where it will not take any particular load, but more or less it is uh, it will subject it to increase in axial strain. Loose specimen again when we started loading it was continuously taking a load and subsequently we will see that increase in load carrying capacity with respect to axial strain that will become more or less constant. So, you again here also we will see that it is continuously uh, almost horizontal line. So, at this particular point you see whether it is loose specimen or it is dense specimen that means loose specimen is the state is the initial state of the soil. Dense specimen is the initial state of the soil. When both the samples are subjected to loading conditions, some same value of diabetic stress, both the samples are reaching to more or less same state. This state is called as critical state. That means, independent of whether the soil is loose or dense, both the samples are corresponding to critical state. Then at the same time, if this is loose sample, we can see over here also, when loose sample is there, so this is corresponding to loose sample, 
when loose sample is subjected to loading condition you can see there is decrease we can see here that in this particular direction E is decreasing and towards the light, uh, left hand side of the screen the word ratio is decreasing. So, whenever word ratio corresponding to loose uh, uh, condition when that particular soil sample is subjected to loading condition you can see there is a reduction in the word ratio which can also be seen by means of strain hardening and once it reaches more or less to the uh, critical state it is more or less there is no further decrease in the word ratio. On the contrary there is tense specimen also. So, this specimen initially started taking loading which is indicated by decrease in void ratio subsequently. So, you can see over here this particular sample even if we take that the two lines are almost reaching to the same state. So, we can see over here So, this is corresponding to dense specimen and this one is corresponding to loose specimen. Now, here both the samples are reaching to the same site condition, same critical state. So, this particular void ratio where whether it is loose specimen after a strain hardening is reaching or a dense specimen after strain softening is reaching or after dilation and contactive behavior is reaching this particular word ratio it is called as E critical or E C. So, I am calling this as critical word ratio and again this particular state is called as critical state. So, independent of the initial state of the I mean depending upon the initial state of the soil will define whether the sample will undergo strain hardening or strain softening, but finally all the samples will be reaching to the same state of uh, uh, critical, critical state all the samples are reaching and corresponding to this particular state this E C is called as critical void ratio. Now, if we uh, try to understand what is happening over here we took a sample confine the sample to particular confining pressure and when the sample is when the confinement is applied to the particular sample then started subjected to diabetic stress increase and measure how much is the axial strain change. Corresponding to these things loose specimen will show the signature of strain hardening or contractive behavior after reaching a particular state of stress there will not be further increase in the diabetic stress or load carrying capacity. Dense specimen on the other, the other hand initially started taking a load reached to a peak value after that there is dilation and then subsequently even those sample will show significantly high axial strain with no further increase in the diabetic stress or no further subsequent decrease also in the diabetic stress. Same if you see with respect to diabetic stress versus void ratio uh, line. So, we can see two specimens are there when loose specimen is there it was subjected to strain hardening and there is reduction in the void ratio reaching to its critical state. On the other hand dense specimens are there which is subjected to initially it will take the load. So, you can see this particular side it is basically indication of strain hardening reached to peak value and then subsequently this is strain softening part reaching to the critical state. Now, as I mentioned this is corresponding to one value of one value of confining pressure confinement or confining pressure. That means, for each value of confining pressure sigma c I can write. So, in the end you are getting corresponding to one value of sigma c one value of sigma c has one E suffix C that means corresponding to one value of confining pressure for a sample whether it is dense sample or loose sample of same soil. Remember the soil remains the same depending upon the relative density of the soil we are categorizing it as a loose specimen or dense specimen. So, sample remain the same depending upon the initial state of the soil before you started applying the load there will be change in the path which the sample takes 
before reaching its critical state. And once it reaches to the critical state, independent of whether the initial state was loose or dry, all the sample will be reaching to same void ratio that is called as critical void ratio. Now, repeating the same procedure, so this is corresponding to one confining pressure, repeating the same procedure, the above procedure for different confining pressures. different confining pressures that means, you have done at one confining pressure obtained the value of sigma c uh, uh, critical void ratio again repeat the same set of experiments corresponding to different value of confining pressure you will get another value of critical void ratio again repeat the same procedure for different different values of confining pressure every time you will get same different values of void ratio that means, critical void ratio. So, collectively based on this what one can obtain is a plot of and remember all these void ratios are defining a state of soil which is called as critical state. So, independent of whether the soil was loose or dense all the soil samples ultimately will reach to critical state. So, E c is critical state void ratio. Now, this is the value of void ratio sigma d uh, 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 diabetic stress and then corresponding to sigma c what we will get over here is critical void ratio line. So, corresponding to diabetic stress and the value of confining pressure we will get some value of void ratio. So, this is like critical void ratio joining all the critical void ratios. So, we will get something like this. So, this is called as critical void ratio line I am calling it as line because generally we try to plot this in terms of diabetic stress versus confining pressure in terms of log value. So, log sigma c and then this is the value of sigma d, you will get this particular line, uh, this is actually void ratio, here also it is void ratio. So, void ratio, so you can see over here corresponding to this value of confining pressure sigma c, this was the value of critical void ratio corresponding to this confining pressure, this was the value. So, joining all the locus this is this line is basically representation of locus of critical void ratio at different different confining pressure. Same thing when you are developing at uh, log sigma 3 or logarithmic of confining pressure E log sigma c curve. So, this is called as E log sigma c curve this is called as this is then appears as uh, in, in form of line which is called as critical void ratio line or CVR line. So, this is also called as CVR. Now, with respect to this particular line, now we have understood that based on the critical state of the soil, let me draw it once again, based on the initial state of the soil, the sample were subject to, to strain hardening or strain softening, finally reaching to same state which is defined by a critical state having certain value of diabetic stress, certain value of confining pressure, certain value of void ratio. Joining the points explaining or representing different value of confining uh, uh, value of uh, critical void ratio at different confining pressure, we try determining CVR line again I am calling it as CVR line. As I mentioned when you are developing it as E sigma c curve it will not appear as a line, once you uh, take log sigma c it will appear as a line. Now, with respect to this particular line, suppose for a particular soil we have obtained this particular line as I mentioned you, this is basically representation of a number of samples of same soil with change in the initial condition or initial state of the soil. Some were representing loose state, some were representing dense state, same soil at different initial state subjected to loading diabetic stress and before that 
it was uh, it was it was uh, uh, corresponding to same value of confining pressure you have applied and after that you started increasing the adiabatic stress. Every time we get critical void ratio joining these points. So, this is basically going to suggest whatever is the sample, whatever is the initial state of the soil, finally the soil sample will reach to this particular part that is the critical void ratio line because every sample is destined to reach to its critical void ratio line or it's 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 destined to reach to its critical void ratio now once the critical void ratio line is known to us take two samples one is dense sample of the same soil corresponding to which this critical void ratio line has been established. So, it is like once for a particular soil critical void ratio line is established. Now, we are interested to find out that with respect to initial state of the soil what path the sample will take to reach to its critical state. Now, this is one sample which is called as loose sample and at the same time we can have. So, this was loose sample and we can have uh, dense sample and we can additionally have two sample. Primarily, we can have two types of sample. Either the sample can be loose or sample can be dense and the critical void ratio line of a soil is developed already based on uh, lot of experimental works. So, we can see based on this. Now, here we see two types of loading in actually. So, at a particular side the soil is either loose or the soil is dense. At the same time, depending upon the boundary condition, depending upon the drainage path available, that means your soil is subjected to loading, diabetic stress, and now because of this additional loading, whether the soil sample is allowed to drain excess pore water or dissipation of excess pore pressure is allowed or it is not allowed. Accordingly, we will have two types of condition. One is drained condition and next one is undrained condition. So, when we talk, when we think from drained condition, drained condition means we are allowing the water to undergo drainage as a result of which there will be change in the void ratio. So, if this is a sample, now, this particular sample is subjected to drained condition. Definitely, when it is subjected to drained condition, there will be reduction in the void ratio, but considering this is dense sample which will be subjected to strain softening, there will be increase in void ratio. That is why we can see there is change in the void ratio or rather increase in the void ratio based res with respect to the initial state. for drained condition. Remember this is drained condition. So, whatever external load you are applying, it is basically uh, uh, resulting in bringing the particles together close to each other. As a result, there will be reduction in the void ratio or in case of loose dense sample, there will be increase in the uh, volume. So, there will be increase in the void ratio. Subsequently, the sample when subjected to drain condition, it is reaching taking this particular path, it is reaching to its critical state. Now, if the same if the sample remains the same, but suppose drainage path is not there, you are having only pervious impervious layers, what will happen? The sample will be subjected to undrained condition. So, this is the path which the sample will take undrained loading, undrained for dense specimen. So, sample is still dense, but now drain is not allowed. So, once drainage is not allowed, certainly we cannot see any change in the void ratio, void ratio is not changing. Now, considering confining pressure that will increase because the dense specimen is there. So, it will be subjected to there will be development of negative pore pressure and then subsequently there will be increase in the value of confinement. So, this is about uh, strain softening. Now, over here we will see another specimen is there which is representation of loose specimen. So, again loose specimen whenever it is subjected to 
drained condition. Remember this is drained condition. Loose specimen means the sample once it is subjected to loading, it will undergo strain hardening and in strain hardening the sample will show contractive behavior. There will be reduction in the void ratio which is indicated by downward arrow for loose specimen. Subsequently, the sample will reach to its initial state, uh, the critical state. On the contrary, the loose specimen is there which is subjected to undrained loading condition, undrained loading. Again, the sample is reaching to its critical void ratio, but rather changing in the void ratio because this is undrained condition. So, water cannot go anywhere, there cannot be change in the void ratio condition. But in this particular case, because it is strain hardening, there will be development of pore water pressure, subsequently reduction in the effective stress or subsequently in this particular case, the confinement. So, confinement will reduce in case of dense specimen, confinement will increase because of dilation. As a result, you are seeing that the initial state of the soil is represented by right side movement for dense specimen till it reaches its critical state. For dense specimen, for loose specimen, because of undrained condition, there will be development of poor water pressure. As a result, your confinement will reduce. Subsequently, the sample, the state of the soil will be represented by left side movement of the sample till it reaches to its critical state. Same if you are looking from E log sigma c curve. So, now this is critical void ratio line again I am I can tell over here this is your dense specimen it will go like this for undrained condition and like this for drained condition. This is for dense specimen, loose specimen you can see over here loose specimen So, this is again undrained condition reduction in the effective stress or change in the reduction in the void ratio. So, this is corresponding to drain condition, this is corresponding to undrained condition. So, now collectively what we have understood whether the soil is subjected to drain condition or undrained condition, whether, whether the initial state of the soil represents it is loose state or dense state, every soil sample will reach to its critical void ratio line. Remember this is critical void ratio line. Now, if you are looking from liquefaction point of view, primarily the phenomena of liquefaction is, uh, is reported in loose soil. So, taking that into account, if I am interested to find out based on the initial state of the soil, what I can get? There are samples. This is your E log sigma c curve. this is my critical void ratio line. And sample is there. Now, I can decide whether the sample is over here or sample is over here. I am calling this as sample number 1, sample number 2. Based on our understanding so far, we can say sample 1 is representation of a soil corresponding to initial state of dense specimen. On the contrary, now, we need not discuss over here whether which particular stress path the soil will take to reach to its critical state. We, we have seen in first and second figure, this is figure 1, this is figure 2 and this is figure 3. So, we have clearly seen that whether the soil sample is loose or dense, whether it is subjected to drain condition or undrained condition, all the sample will reach to critical state. Now, depending upon the initial state of the soil, some sample will reach to critical state may be at higher void ratio corresponding to the other that also depends upon what is the level of confining stress you have applied to a particular sample before started applying the deviatic stress. Now, coming over to figure 3, 
So, we have established the critical void ratio line for a particular sample and then at times I am interested to find out which particular soil sample is out of these 1 and 2 is actually susceptible to liquefaction. Susceptible to liquefaction means if favorable loading conditions are given to the sample, which of the two samples are subjected to or can undergo liquefaction during the state when it is reaching to its critical void ratio line. See critical void ratio line finally every sample will reach, but something is happening between the critical void ratio line and initial state of the soil where the phenomena of liquefaction will also come we will discuss uh, later. Now here two samples are there this is representation of loose sample, this is representation of dense sample, this is based on the initial state and also considering the fact that dense specimens are less prone or not prone to liquefaction this particular zone which is located or all the samples which are located below which are represented by critical void ratio line and corresponding to. So, you can see E c or void ratio. Now, I am not writing here E c initially I wrote because whenever I am taking any sample 1, 2 or in this particular case also dense or loose specimen, I am also trying to see how the state of the soil changes. So, not every time when it, where it is subjected to drain condition in loose soil or in dense soil not every time when the state of the soil or the state of stress is changes it will not be represented by critical word ratio. So, critical word ratio is just one value, but at the time when you are loading this particular soil sample the word ratio will change which will not be called as critical word ratio. And since this change of stresses we are representing by upward and downward lines for dense and loose specimens respectively I am not marking here as critical word ratio. So, this particular soil sample or all the soils whose initial state represent that the sample should be located below the critical word ratio line all these are representation of non susceptible, non susceptible to liquefaction. So, any sample based on the initial state of the soil once it is falling below the critical word ratio line, the sample is declared as not susceptible to liquefaction. On the other hand, all the samples which are located above critical word ratio line as mentioned over here. So, these are representation of corresponding to any value of confining pressure thus the word ratio can be higher or lower all these are susceptible to liquefaction. So, you can call it as susceptible to liquefaction. So, based on the initial state and demarcating the boundaries between loose and dense specimen, one is able to identify whether the soil is susceptible to liquefaction or it is not susceptible to liquefaction. Now, whether the soil will undergo liquefaction or not that we will discuss as I mentioned earlier that we will discuss in lecture number 24, how to quantify the, the liquefaction potential of a particular site and determining its factor of safety that we will discuss in lecture 24. Now, this based on this though we can identify the, whether the soil will undergo liquefaction or not. So, here we can say this is dense or dilated behavior, this is loose specimen or contractive behavior. Now, based on this one can write that critical word ratio line demarcates the boundary between loose sample or dense sample or it can demarcate the boundary between samples which are susceptible to liquefaction and which are not susceptible to liquefaction. Now, one limitation which later on was highlighted corresponding to critical word ratio line that though it states that uh, it though defines the state of the soil whether it is loose soil or dense soil to reach critical state, but later on many of the actual field studies suggested that there were samples which actually were plotted based on the initial state below the critical void ratio line. Whenever these samples actually subjected to actual earthquake loading conditions had actually undergone liquefaction. 
that means at many instances uh, one instance was during fog dam four dam four deck dam so there was an earthquake during which even the samples which were located below the critical void ratio lines were found to undergone liquefaction it is primarily because the critical void ratio line is basically representation of the critical state of the soil and with respect to the initial state of the soil. So, as I mentioned some time back that when you start with the initial state of the soil that is whether the sample is 1 or the sample is 2, all the sample how these are reaching to critical state and during this particular stage of loading whether any particular stage comes where the resistance offered by the soil and the state of stress or the loading by external earthquake loading what is the relative comparison that primarily was uh, uh, not uh, clearly identified corresponding to samples during fog dam. So, for deck dam some samples which identified as non liquefiable as per critical void ratio line were later found liquefiable. So, as a result Kese and uh, uh, 1930s later on work they identified that this is the in inability of strain control drain test to capture all the phenomena which are happening for loose sample as well as dense sample which are actually responsible to understand the initiation of liquefaction. So, if one is interested to find out how the initiation of liquefaction at a particular site has happened or is going to happen during a particular earthquake then the strain control drain test so far we were discussing about when this uh, understanding of critical void ratio line was proposed perhaps were not able to capture all the phenomena which were actually covered in the uh, drain controlled uh, uh, strain control test drain test strain control test. So, later on Castro which we will discuss in uh, lecture number 22. So, Castro in 1960 came up they control many more tests and try to find out that similar to critical uh, state of the soil there is additional boundary condition based on which we can uh, that will help in understanding the initial state of the soil and how the initial state of the soil changes with respect to loading condition whether it is corresponding to uh, uh, I mean no more it will be called as uh, susceptible or not susceptible rather it is basically corresponding to how much is the confinement available and how much is the initial state of the soil which is available to offer resistance. So, we will discuss further detail in, uh, uh, in lecture 22 about steady state line or steady state of the soil, steady state line. So, with this I will uh, conclude this particular lecture. So, in today's lecture we have discussed about primarily when we are discussing about liquefaction occurrence there are two types of uh, uh, two conditions one uh, has the soil has to meet one is the soil should be cohesionless secondly the soil should have very high ground water table because after all it is uh, more related to uh, development of excess pore pressure. Now, in actual site condition where the soil may or may not undergo liquefaction the soil sample can be in loose state or the soil sample can be in dense state. Whenever these samples are subjected to strain control drain test, we identify that both the samples are reaching to critical state. Dense sample is subjected to initial take the load followed by peak value and then subjected to strain softening. Loose sample on the other hand will be subjected to strain hardening and subsequently reaching to the same state more or less where the dampel, uh, dense sample has reached at very high axial strain. Same way if we look from void ratio point of view initially there will be reduction in the void ratio in the dense specimen reaching to peak value and then subsequently there is increase in the void ratio. Loose sample since the beginning as the loading proceeds progresses there will be reduction in the void ratio. That means whether it is sample is loose or dense for a particular soil at one value of confining pressure you will have one value of critical void ratio. Repeat the same set for same soil, but at different different confining pressure 
will get a complete locus of n number of points which are representation of critical void ratio at one value of confining pressure and subsequently so n number of critical void ratio corresponding to n number of confining pressures. Joining all those points we will get on E sigma c that is confining pressure plot a curve which on E log sigma c plot is also represented by a line defined as critical void ratio line. So, this critical void ratio line is the locus of all points representing the critical void ratio or critical state of a soil sample where whenever it is subjected to different level of confining pressure. Now, when the same sample when a particular site whether the soil sample can be loose or soil sample can be dense, it can be also subjected to drain condition or undrained condition. When we are talking about drain condition for loose sample, then it will be subjected to reduction in the word ratio subsequently reaching to its critical word ratio line. Whenever it is subjected to undrained condition, there will be building up of poor water pressure subsequently reduction in the confinement. On the contrary, when dense sample is there subjected to strain softening, there will be reduction in the uh, uh, confining pressure subsequently the sample will reach to its critical state. Whenever dense sample is there and also is subjected to drained condition, then there will be because of strain hard uh, softening there will be increase in the word ratio as the sample reaches to its critical word ratio line. In the end because in some of the instances uh, the, the identification of whether the soil is susceptible or not based on critical word ratio line was failed then later on late, uh, it was firstly identified that it was primarily because of strain control tests which were uh, available at that particular time. So, they could not capture properly the variation with respect to the initial state of the soil to uh, the critical word ratio line or the critical state. So, later on in uh, 1960 Castro performed lot of uh, uh, other tests and came up with another understanding related to steady state line ident which will help in identifying first how the initial state of the soil changes and how the initiation of liquefaction can be studied with respect to the initial state of the soil and with respect to additional loading whether it can be because of uh, static loading or it can be because of dynamic loading. So, that we will continue in lecture number 23 and lecture number 22. So, thank you everyone, we will stop here.